Good morning, esteemed guests of the Bank of Namibia today. Uh, we are just slightly delayed and we will start in the next five to ten minutes, so please be patient with us. Thank you. Amid significant global and local challenges, our country's financial system has demonstrated stability, strength and resilience. The Monetary Policy Committee, MPC of the Bank of Namibia, ended its two-day meeting yesterday. The MPC decided to increase the rebel rate by 50 basis points to 7.75% with immediate effect. We stayed the course by safeguarding price stability. Borrowers benefited from access to credit, while savers preserved their savings amidst a monetary policy tightening cycle. Our banks have sustained profitability, liquidity and robust capital levels, while the overall financial system has demonstrated remarkable strength in a challenging post-COVID-19 situation. We sparked innovation and competition in the financial services industry by spearheading access to banking customer data by third-party providers who are developing value-added services through the establishment of the Open Banking Forum. We have transformed point-of-sale transactions by setting guidelines for the standardization of quick response codes within the national payment system. In collaboration with the Ministry of Finance and Public Enterprises, we reignited the economic recovery of SMEs by relaunching the $500 million Namibian dollar SME Economic Recovery Loan Scheme. We have continued targeted relief measures to lessen the economic impact of COVID-19 on households and businesses. We ensured an adequate currency supply, achieving a record increase in currency in circulation from 4.9 billion Namibian dollars in 2022 to 5.2 billion Namibian dollars in 2023. The Virtual Assets Act to license and regulate virtual asset service providers was passed and the bank was given the responsibility to ensure their effective supervision thereby protecting the public from engaging with unlicensed traders and promote financial stability. Our laws were modernized, ensuring that the financial sector aspirations were aligned with international standards while promoting transformation, financial inclusion and corporate governance. 
We have achieved a balanced gender representation in management reflecting our workforce's commitment to diversity with 54% female and 46% male profile. We emphasize continuous capacity building on a future fit workforce and saw our team complete 400 online courses and engage in 197 face-to-face -face events. We have moved Namibia closer to sustainable economic growth and recovery by fostering dialogue and discourse with key stakeholders to align national development objectives. We sought to collaborate with prominent central banks in Africa and elsewhere through which we fostered innovation and hosted meetings of the Common Monetary Area and Committee of Central Banks in SADC that propelled the regional integration agenda. Through our bursary scheme, we have continued to foster the next generation of professionals by awarding seven bursaries to students in 2023. Through the Graduate Accelerated Program and Internship Opportunities, we have successfully prepared and integrated a new cohort, thereby enhancing our talent pipeline and operational capacity. In 2023, our actions have reflected our drop in the ocean to the prosperity and resilience of Namibia.
Mr. Flexman Samuel, the CEO and our host, the CEO of the Ludwitz Waterfront Development Company, our host. Thank you for hosting us today. Your, our acknowledgement goes to you. Uh, the honorable councillors present here today, um, our invited guests, uh, members of the public, members of the media, viewers who are joining us online and from our uh, social media platforms, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm Suzette Apollos and I'm from the Bank of Namibia's Communications and International Relations Department. Hosting events such as this public lecture holds immense value for the Bank of Namibia. These gatherings offer invaluable opportunities for us to unite, exchange ideas, and mutually learn. Furthermore, they exemplify the bank's dedication to spearheading the national development agenda through its re research capabilities, which directly shape policies that impact us all. Therefore, the significance of such events cannot be overstated and they are crucial for our collective adv advancement and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, some of us in the Bank of Namibia team, including our governor and myself, hail from the South and we are very proud of this. And thus, it is indeed an honor for us and the entire Bank of Namibia team to be in your pi picturesque town of Ludritz. However, before I call upon the governor of the Bank of Namibia, I would like to take a minute to introduce him to you. Mr. Johannes Gavachap um, has been at the helm of the Bank of Namibia as the governor since June 2020. As the governor, he is also the chairperson of the board of directors of the bank. He is an accomplished and transformational Namibian business leader with an impeccable background and track record in financial services, finance, financial economics, investment, and strategy. With vast experience of over 46 years, Mr. Kavachap has worked as a senior executive in financial services, spanning banking, investment, insurance, property, and casualty, primarily in South Africa, West Africa, and East Africa. He also worked in Europe. Mr. Kavachap has served in high-profile senior leadership positions in business and society, such as chairperson of the high-level panel of the Namibia economy, chairperson of the boards of Old Mutual Nigeria, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Ghana, and Malawi. He's been the chairperson of Rossing Uranium Limited, chairperson of NAMCOR, and chairperson of the Social Security Commission. He is a holder of a Bachelor of Arts and Master of Business Leadership from the University of South Africa, Master of Arts from the Graduate Business School, Kingston. He has a certificate in Global Leadership from the London School of Business and has attended an Advanced Management Program at the Harvard Business School. At the Bank of Namibia, we are honored to tap from this well of wisdom and can certainly feel his impact. Without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the Governor of the Bank of Namibia, Mr. Johannes Kavachap. Thank you very much, Suzette, for the kind and generous introduction. Good afternoon. For everyone in this auditorium, everyone that's following us on social media, welcome to this public lecture titled, Positioning Namibia's Oil and Gas Endowments, Avoiding the Dutch Disease. The outline for the presentation is, I would like to share briefly the purpose of this lecture, then look at the recent discoveries, zoom into the definition, symptoms and examples of the Dutch disease, 
Look at countries that have been very successful after they have discovered oil and gas, countries that have not been that successful. And when I talk about those countries, it's really not to blame and say anything bad about those countries. It's merely to demonstrate the point of who were the winners and who were the losers. What are the lessons for Namibia for countries that have discovered oil? What must we do and not do? What are the options for Ludrets? What are the opportunities for the Claras region? And then recap options for Namibia. There are so many young people that are asking me, oil and gas is coming, hydrogen is coming. Where must we position ourselves? Hopefully towards the end of this presentation, I'll have an opportunity to zoom into those opportunities that you can start positioning yourself to. And then talk about what is the Bank of Namibia doing and conclude the lecture. If there is time, we can take a couple of questions. If we run out of time, hopefully, our communications department can facilitate another interaction how we can deal with that. So the purpose of this public lecture is how to position Namibia's oil and gas endowments and manage the inherent Dutch disease risk that comes with natural resource development. Now, in early 2022, significant developments regarding oil and gas discoveries were confirmed in Namibia. The discoveries of potentially large crude oil reserves in Namibia have initiated discussions on its potential impact on the Namibian economy and how it could alter the course of development. We all know that between 2021 and 2023, oil and gas discoveries in Namibia have drawn close to 25 billion Namibian dollars, equivalent to close to 2 billion US dollars in foreign direct investment. So if you look at an overview of development in the oil and gas industry in the country, Namibia is said to account for about 13, 1-3% of all offshore rigs operating on the African continent, of total energy committing 50% of its global exploration budget for 2023 to spend 5.5 billion Namibian dollars, or about 300 million US dollars, appraising its Venice discovery in the Orange Basin. Namibia's exploration and production, or the ENP sector, is expected to attract significant investments. Besides oil and gas, there are also green hydrogen developments. Global demand for green hydrogen is expected to increase from about 140 metric tons per annum in 2013 to 660 metric tons per annum in 2015. With this, its world-class renewable energy sources, Namibia is poised to help meet global demand. They say other countries also have got good solar, they've got good wind, but the big thing we also have got is we've got good land. Besides water, wind, solar, we've got good land. We've got vast land in the country. So the German government has extended the letter of intent to enter drug supporting hyphen hydrogen energies, green hydrogen project in Namibia. The initiative valued at about 10 billion US dollars is poised to set a new president for strategic foreign undertakings receiving targeted support from Germany, a nation at the forefront of the green hydrogen revolution. Hyphen Hydrogen Energy, a Namibian-based renewable energy firm has been awarded the preferred bird status for developing green hydrogen for Namibia. What do these discoveries mean for Namibia? Potentially, it could double our gross domestic product. It could double our output. If you just look at total foreign direct investment flows from oil and gas over the past three years, from 2021 to 2023, you could actually see what has happened in terms of flows into the Namibian economy from direct in foreign direct investment. 
the low levels of exploration benefits a 10% and deteriorating current account balance point to the Dutch disease risk for Namibia. So what do you see, what are the signs for us, and I'll get to the next slide to that, but probably to build up now. You could see that through increasing natural resource exports that can result from currency appreciation, when people start investing in oil and gas and our currency, the Namibia dollar, is value is increasing, we talk about currency appreciation. And that can encourage imports and can discourage exports in other sectors as they become less competitive. It could also affect the current account of the balance of payments. In Namibia, we look at our current account of our balance of payments in 2023, and the deficit deteriorated as exploration and appraisal activities intensified. Our current account is worsened to 15% in 2023 from 12% in 2022. So when you see those type of things, you could see the first signs that we need to manage. What is this Dutch disease, or some people are calling it a resource curse? It is also known as the paradox of the plain dean. That refers to the paradox that countries with an abundance of natural resources, like oil and gas, like certain minerals, tend to have less economic growth, they tend to have less democracy and worse development outcomes than countries with fewer natural resources. And this is normally caused by uneven growth across sectors due to the discovery of natural resources. So when we get oil and gas, everybody is focusing on oil and gas we forget the rest of the industries that we have got. A town like Ludritz is a fishing town. You know, fishing, processing is what kept this town together. But if we find oil and gas, and if we ignore our fishing industry, we are making a big mistake. So we should never forget what makes Ludritz what it is currently. So Dutch disease is normally caused by the mismanagement in the natural resources, you get corruption in terms of the allocation thereof. And we are not going to be the first one. And we'll be looking now at countries that have found oil and gas so that we can learn from that. So where did this name Dutch disease originate from? In the 1960s, the Netherlands discovered gas reserves in the North Sea. The non-oil sector became less competitive unemployment rose from 1.1% to 5.1%. So the Netherlands is also known as Dutch, as we all know about. So the term was coined by the Economist magazine in 1977 to describe the decline of the manufacturing industry in the Netherlands. What are the symptoms that we as Namibians should look out for that when we get oil and gas, we don't run into this Dutch disease. If we see structural economic change in a booming sector, it's only oil and gas that's booming. There's a movement from workers. Labor is moving from traditional or manufacturing export sector. Everybody is going into oil and gas. We see decreasing profit for traditional or manufacturing sector. If we see people don't want to work into fishing in Lutherans anymore, yeah, people don't want to work in fish processing anymore, everyone wants to go to oil and gas. Those are the first signs that we have got a Dutch disease. If we see decreasing traditional or manufacturing exports, so we don't export enough fish as we used to in the past, we see expectation of oil and gas on a large scale there's increased government revenues through increased inflows in foreign exchange. There's increased income for factors of production and non-traded output. Inflation, food is getting expensive, pool is getting expensive. The currency is getting stronger, the Namibian dollar is appreciating. 
the structural unemployment. We are importing more because we've got so much money we can buy anything, basically. Corruption and rent sinking activities are increasing in the economy is actually, in terms of growth, is quite depressed, low economic growth. Those are the signs of the Dutch disease. Where did we see this in the world? One of the countries that we're using is, through this research, is Venezuela. Before oil was discovered in Venezuela, the economy of Venezuela was primarily agriculture. They had good coffee and cacao. Until the 20th century, it was the poorest economy in Latin America. They have discovered oil and gas, and by 1970, after the first commercial oil of 1917, it became the richest country in Latin America and one of the 20 richest countries in the world. It was home to the world's largest oil reserves. Between 1978 and 2001, Venezuela's economy went sharply in reverse. Non-oil gross domestic product declined by 19.19%. Oil gross domestic product declined by 65%. There was simply poor governance and corruption resulted in political and economic instability. So that is one example of a country that was really based on agriculture. They found oil, they become rich, and all of a sudden we know now the country is going through difficult challenges from an economic point of view and from a political point of view. Another country with a more recent history, and I said when I started off, for those who are only dialing in, it's not that we are saying bad things about these countries. We are trying to learn from what has happened in the world. If you look at the example of the Dutch disease in Ghana, Ghana discovered oil in 2007, commercial production commenced in 2010. It achieved high income and economic growth after periods of low and negative growth before the discovery of oil. They have got the highest gross domestic product growth of 14% at one stage. Currently, the country is showing signs of the Dutch disease with decreasing economic activity. After COVID, the country went and borrowed a lot of money offshore, and currently they are going through a very difficult time in terms of the debt that they have got. The currency has weakened in the meantime now, and they have been bailed out by the IMF. IMF actually gave enough money for the country just to see it through. They have neglected the agricultural se sector. You know, Ghana is one of the countries well known for cacao. So they have neglected the agricultural sector with its contribution to gross domestic product declining from about 30%, 30% in 2010 to 18%, 18% in 2020. Another country that we all know is Nigeria as well. Now before oil was discovered in Nigeria, it was mainly an agrarian economy and agriculture contributed about 72% of the output in 1950. After they have discovered oil, agriculture's contribution to gross domestic product dwindled to about from 72% to 21% in 2021. Manufacturing output averaged less than 10% of gross domestic product between 2005 and 2022. We know what has happened in Angola, uh, in, in Nigeria, as far as oil is concerned. That's Dutch disease. Also, not far from us in Angola, they discovered oil. They exploited onshore since the 1950s. But in the late 1960s, major offshore discoveries attracted multinational investments. We see currently total energies, we see 
Shell, we see Gulp. That's the type of investments that Angola also attracted. The country's powerful oil and gas industry has enabled the country's rapid growth, but there was an over-reliance on those revenues, and that has posed major challenges for Angola. It is estimated that the number of Angolans living below the poverty line is between 36 and 68 percent of the total population in Angola. However, Angola has learned from the mistakes and are turning over a new leaf. If you visit the country now, they have seen what mistakes they have made and they are trying to turn it over now so that the country can benefit. After the oil crash, in 2016 the oil, cra oil price crashed and it cost the currency, the Kwanzaa, weakened significantly, about 51% from about 105 Kwanzaa per US dollar to almost 159 Kwanzaa, just to get one US dollar. So our currency, the Namibia dollar, if we are not careful, and if we do what the other countries like Woodruff mentioned have done, we could see a depreciation of the currency. They struggle to import due to fall in the oil revenue. We have quite a lot of tourism, whether it's quite a lot of Angolan colleagues who are coming to Namibia for doctors. There's a lot of students that were coming because they were doing so well with the oil. But after that oil prices crashed, we have just seen all the people that used to come from Angola to Namibia, to the doctors, to universities, that were renting houses that have dried down because the currency has crashed. So these graphs that you see, they are all telling the same story. Despite the different numbers depicted in each one of them, growth is not guaranteed simply because you have discovered oil. Many people think if we get oil and gas, we're going to grow like nobody wants that. It's not guaranteed. Without proper management and a visionary plan, growth for Namibia will not be realized. But with proper management and firm visionary leadership, we can realize economic growth from the riches that oil and gas will bring. These are oil, all oil exporting countries, but the growth is not constant. Just have a look at that. Growth is so volatile. It's not on an upward trajectory. Granted, there will be periods of economic downturns that are unavoidable, such as COVID, but these countries experience periods of extremely low growth. And any commodity that you have got, whether it's oil, whether it's diamonds, the price never stay the same. It's always volatile. So we need to make sure that there is not over-reliance on one commodity. But again, there are also success stories. Not all the countries that have found oil and gas are failures or did not succeed. If you look at a country like Norway, Norway took a different direction from the rest of the oil producing countries. They took the decision not to rely on the oil to finance the budget, except in small percentages. They kept the oil revenue separate and took only 4% annually to support the general budget. The Norwegian government focused on fighting inflation, devolving educational, technical, and industrial planning. And that's what they have done. They have created a fund from the oil revenues that they have received called the Government Pension Fund Global. And we know that Norway is investing significantly in the rest of the world. They have cleverly negotiated contracts and operating terms set by the Norwegian government to ensure that all citizens, all citizens benefited from oil in Norway. The UAE, United Arab Emirates, also a success story. That's always a desert that we see there. 
but everybody is going to Dubai nowadays. Tourism and hospitality. The UAE has made significant investments in building world-class infrastructure and iconic attractions such as the Burj Khalifa and Palm Jumeirah. Dubai and Abu Dhabi have become major global tourist destinations attracting millions of visitors each year. If you look at financial services, the UAE has established itself as a regional financial hub with Dubai leading the way. The Dubai International Financial Centers attracted numerous multinational corporations, banks, to set up shop. And they have really diversified into tourism, financial services, trade and logistics, technology and innovation. So what are the lessons that we can learn as Namibia from all these oil producing economies? First one is long-term planning. We need to have a long-term goal of what we want and where we want to see the country in the years to come. If we get these oil revenues, there must be a plan what we want to do with that. We need to avoid complacency when revenue starts to flow in or become wasteful and start spending as if there's no tomorrow. We need to ensure strong and competent institutions that are transparent and free of corruption. We need to have strong institutions in our country. We also look at stabilization fund. You know, we have in Namibia created the Velvicia Fund, and the Velvicia Fund was basically for two key reasons, to help buffer the economy if we get another COVID or similar shock that's negative. We shouldn't run around to go and find money. We should take some of these oil revenues and put to a fund like that, so that if difficult days come, we can go and get from that one. We also need to save for the future generations that will come. And Velvicha is doing both those two things that we want. We need to diversify our economy. We need to understand that oil is a resource that is very volatile in terms of prices. We also need to understand this oil is not going to be there forever. At some point, it will be depleted. We need to make sure, as far as local content is possible, that we get Namibians to participate. If Namibians don't participate in this, we will have challenges. So in the entire value chain, we need to get local participation. We need to make sure that we have got appropriate fiscal and monetary policy frameworks that are supportive of macroeconomic stability. Right, so if we get back to Namibia, economic diversification options for Namibia, if we get oil, for the energy sector, the most obvious beneficiary is the energy sector itself. People are asking us, you know, oil and gas is coming, which sectors, which industries are going to win? Where must we start looking and positioning ourselves? I think the first one is the obvious one is the energy sector oil and gas extraction, oil and gas refining, distribution industries, experience significant growth, creating revenue and generating jobs. One of the African countries, one of our neighbors, have just taken a decision where they said, we will set up a Namibian oil company that will import all the oil. You know, we're not going to get foreign companies to import oil, but we'll get a Namibian company to do that. They don't produce oil, so, but the fact that they have done that tells you they want the local people to benefit. The second one is in the infrastructure development. Countries with newfound oil and gas reserves often invest in infrastructure. So if we find oil and gas, Ludrets will see projects as the, we need to look at the roads in Ludrets. So if you're in road construction, get yourself ready if that comes. We need airports. We have got an airport at Ludritz, but it's, when I arrived this morning, it's such a small airport. It's going to become something big. And at airports, you have got all kinds of shops, restaurants, whatever. 
if that happens, that will happen. You will have got utilities to support the energy industry and facilitate economic growth. Right now, what's the quickest place where you can get in now and start doing business in Lutherans while they are still doing appraisal and while they are still trying to flow the walls? The obvious thing is transportation, catering, accommodation. Those are the industries that are going to benefit easily right now. If you want to know what must I try and do as a Namibia now to get into this, catering should be a no-brainer. Accommodation should be a no-brainer at this stage. Just vessels to take all these people back to 300 kilometers in and back. Yeah, there must be Namibians that are able to hire helicopters, do deals with these people to transport them. These people are going to get sick. So hospitals, private hospitals will probably, people have to start looking at that. Manufacturing, increased availability of energy resources can lead to some manufacturing industries that will be needed. So we'll have to look at that. Tourism and hospitality. These people, if they start coming, not only, when will they produce that? Tourism and hospitality is going to be. We need a couple of hotels in, in Lutherans. We don't have hotels for tourists. You don't have hotels for business people. We need skills development. We need Namibians to be trained for the various sectors. If I'm a young Namibian now, if I were a young Namibian finishing grade 11, grade 12, and asking what to study, and you really are mathematically inclined, petrol engineering, any, in, any f career that you're going to get into oil and gas. You know, in four or five years' time, if these things happen, you can walk into a job now. So if you now go to university and you go and study things, if you want employment, you try and get into things that will give you employment in the oil and gas, into green hydrogen. Particularly for parents, if you don't know what your child should study, if you want the child to help, now is the time to tell the child, my child, I'm hearing about this thing, oil and gas is coming, help me with that, and you send the kids over there. Technology and innovation and financial services, those are the industries that are going to benefit. How can literates leverage the opportunities of the discoveries? So we are in literates, how can we leverage these? I've highlighted what the Dutch disease is. I've highlighted this with country cases, those that were subjected to it, and those that managed to avoid it. Now I would like to look at what role Lutherans can play to help Namibia to avoid the resource curse. Lutherans is at the heart of the oil and gas exploitation and green hydrogen development in Namibia. According to reports by McKinsey, and local production of towers and blades has the potential to contribute an additional 700 million US dollars to Namibia's gross domestic product by 2050. You see all these wind turbines, if we only produce that in Ludrets, it's going to be used for the economy of Ludrets. What we need is business people in Ludrets or business people in Namibia to produce those blades in the country. Current manufacturing projects in Lutherans are centered around fish and fish processing. So we need to start looking at if there's oil and gas come, who's going to help us with towers and blades because it's a big industry on itself. We don't have to figure out later. We can produce tanks that need to transport ammonia if the green hydrogen gets off the ground. We have got a port. Ports are responsible for a significant rise of environmental impacts, for example, through carbon emissions, soil and water pollution, as well as loss of biodiversity. We have noticed that climate change had significant impact on the country. Therefore, the port of Lutheran should be used as a clean energy hub to reduce the impacts of climate change on the country. So the port that you have got has got enormous opportunity to contribute to decarbon our country. The wind turbine technology, the following, if you look at Ludritz, the following projects are currently underway in Ludritz. There is a 50 megawatt 
IPP power project on going in Lutherans. There's a 44 megawatt wind project. NAMPOWER's previously 40 megawatt wind project was converted into a 7 to 100 megawatt solar PV, and that moved from Lutherans to closer to Rospinam. However, it's still in the Claras region that we have got. So Lutherans can really play an important role in terms of contributing to the economy of the country. Lutherans can become the energy capital of Namibia. Lutherans as the energy capital of Namibia, there has never been a more critical time in the history of our country to help accelerate the global transition to clean, renewable energy and Lutherans location is ideal because of the extensive solar and wind resources and the proximity to the ocean, both as a water source and a port. As the country prepares for oil and gas sector as well as the green hydrogen, Lutherans has been selected by the government as the hub of the pilot phase of the green hydrogen project and base for most of the onshore oil and gas development. So what is coming? Enormous opportunities are coming for Lutherans. There's going to be a lot of demand for land, for offices, for residential in Lutherans. There's going to be a lot of people, if oil and gas come, that will look for education for their children. So if you can start a primary school, private government, if you can start a pre-primary school, children will go to work and they would like places where they can keep the children. People get sick that will come to Lutheran, so you'll need public and private hospitals. Some people will be well paid, they'll probably look for private medical care. Financial services, people who like to do businesses more than just withdrawing and depositing money, they need financial service products. That's more than what we have got. People will be, people eat when they are alive. So they would like places where they have got coffee. They would like places where they like eat, restaurants. Energy will be a big demand for this expanding town of Lutherans. So it's going to be a lot of opportunities. The oil and gas alone, they said the capital expenditures will be around 10 billion US dollars. That's about 180 billion. And just to give you an, an sort of a reference point, at the latest budget, our Minister of Finance has tabled a budget of 100 billion for this current financial year. This thing alone will be, in oil and gas, will be 180 billion. So this is something significant that's coming to Lutherans. And most activities will be concentrated around Lutherans. I hope this town 60 kilometers from, what's the town 60 kilometers from Lutherans? Ours, is it ours? Is it, not, is it not another closer town to Lutherans apart from ours? Those are towns that definitely, if you look at what's happening in Walfisbach, Walfisbach and Swakopmon, they are busy, you know, it's, it's about 30 k's, but you see a lot of development that's happening. I wouldn't be surprised if you see ours also benefiting from what's going to happen in, in Lutherans. The hyphen wind and solar energy project is also estimated around 10 billion US dollars, another 180 billion Namibian dollars. That's going to be a five gigawatt of renewable capacity. I understand two gigawatts will be commissioned by January 2027 and balanced before the end of the decade. Many people said when they decide if they can commercially extract oil and gas, and that could happen anything that I understand between 29 and 20, 2030. To construct those oil fields, they'll need about 15,000 construction workers. And they'll take four years to construct that. You know, many people are saying maybe in 26, 27, this is where you get a final investment decision. And for four years, if it is 26, 29, 2030, you could see the first oil flowing in the country provided 
they can extract that commercially. So that's going to be in the end 3,000 permanent jobs. So those people who need housing, those people need children, schools, hospitals, energy. Currently, we need, if we don't have Namibians, we look at Qatar. You know that Qatar has got about 400,000 Qataris, and there are currently 3 million people in Qatar. And what they have realized is that we are only 400,000. We have got all these endowments of natural resources. We don't have the skills. And they have decided we're going to get the best skills from the world to come and help develop our country. We're going to get the best skills to transfer skills. We're going to make a distinction between citizens and residents. So the 400,000 Qataris are serious citizens. The rest of the people that are helping us, they make good money. They are residents. This is how some people manage that. So we probably have to start looking out immigration laws. If oil and gas comes, if we don't have the skills, that we have got flexible approaches, how we can attract skills without disadvantaging Namibians. That can be done. 30% SMEs and local companies, 20% youth participation, and salaries in the oil and gas industry is a big, big issue that we'll see. So these discoveries and developments in the Karas region and Lutherans will attract and lead to immigration into the region and Lutherans. So you know better than I do about the expansion of the town of Lutherans that's being planned. As a positive and important first step, the town council has developed a plan to expand the townland area of Lutherans in six phases. However, a number of challenges will collectively need to be addressed, including existing mining licenses and EPL allocations preventing delaying the urban expansion. We'll have to look at the topography to the east and north of the town that restricting the use of available land. And clearly, people are working already around that in Ludras. There are also funding limitations. We need to come up with some bankable projects, get money that can invest into those projects. And we need to look at the availability of water because these industries require a lot of water that we currently, than we can currently generate in. Opportunities for Ludrats and for Clara's region. The economic profile of Ludrats is mostly centered around fishing, tourism, logistics, retail, and amenities. The fishing industry provides more than 80% of employment and comprises commercial fishing as well as subsistence fishing in Ludrats. The fishing industry has been on a decline over the past five to 10 years because companies are transferring the quotas to Valpes by due to the low operation costs, according to the, some research. But oil and gas is going to offer additional opportunities to the revival of the town's economy. The influx of people into Lutherans will require an improvement and enhancement of the various service provision, including health and expansion of the banking and financial services. The town could build the only oil and gas training facility in the country, partnering either NAST or UNAM to leverage on the new industry and use the oil and gas industry players as part-time lecturers. There are so many retired people that would like to come and lecture here in, in Ludritz. Um, the first thing we need to start looking at if we get oil and gas is to really get either NAS, IGM, or Junam to, to have a compass here. So it would be sad if they don't have, if they already have God, to offer those courses will be the natural thing to do that. We need to build and improve hospitals. We need to expand provision of banking and financial services. And we need to build training facility for oil and gas and green hydrogen. The Nekertal Dam, Namibia's largest dam, is situated in Klaras region. 
It was reported to be 89% full in November 2023. The abundance of water and land presents numerous opportunities, such as irrigation of green schemes. You know, by now, we should utilize the water from Nekertal Dam to feed ourselves. Food security is such a big challenge with climatic challenges we have got in the country at this point in time. Some parts of our country have not received good rains, and we are sitting with Nekertal Dam that can contribute to ease food security challenges that we have got, and that's an opportunity for us. How should Ludrats and the Taras region get all this done? I think mapping the future of Ludrats will require the nation to collectively address several crucial factors. First and foremost, sourcing government and development funding will be essential to ensure that adequate resources are availed for infrastructure development. You will really need to allocate money to develop the infrastructure that will support these new industries that will come. I don't think Lutherich Town Council alone will be able to fund the infrastructure that's required. We will need the central government to, to help with funding with that. We need to monitor existing mining licenses and EPL allocations. We need to get the buy-in of key stakeholders in Lutherans and Taras region. We need to identify priorities within the expansion plan. We need to be intentional about what are the priority areas for Lutherans itself. Now, if you just go and want to do everything, it's probably not going to work. So the focus should be, we should have a laser-like focus on what are the priority sectors, what is that that we need to start with and the rest will follow later. We plan for rail, road, air, and port facilities upgrade. How do we start? How do we phase? How do we bring in business people to help us with this? Because as business people and Lutherans, we can do that, but on our own, we won't. We need to follow the example of what Qatar has done that. To recap what my presentation was about today, we need to avoid the resource curse, we need to avoid the Dutch disease. How do we do this? We need to build competent and capable, accountable institutions. We need to manage petroleum revenue and save for future generations. We need to diversify our economy. Don't rely too much on oil and gas if it comes. Don't ignore your fishing sector. Don't ignore your manufacturing sector. Diversify the economy. Don't rely on one thing only because commodities have got their cycles and the prices of commodities are very, very volatile. We need to be open for transfer of skills and knowledge. Where we don't have the skills, we shouldn't be ashamed to open up our country for the rest of the world, for people to come. We know who are the citizens and we know who are the residents. So we shouldn't have big issue around how we deal with that. We need to prepare the country, particularly Ludrets, for the new endowments. And we need to plan it from the center, together with the local councillors, together with the leadership of Ludrets. We need, as a country, to collectively plan for what is coming. Because if we leave that only to Ludrets, it's not going to work. Or if you do it without Ludrets, it's not going to work. So what we need is a collective approach as Namibians and as Buchters to go and help set up our country for what's going to come. We need to maximize, thank you, maximize local value creation. We need to prepare Namibian industries. And I've tried to give you an indication of which industries are coming. I said immediately, catering, transport, you know, those are the things that are immediate. Over long term, I've painted a picture for you where you can start preparing yourself. Because unless we prepare and get ourselves ready, do you know what will happen? The train will leave the station and will be still be on the platform, waiting for the next train. And we'll probably miss the second train as well. So we better start prepare for the train not to stay on the platform. What is Boy Bank of Namibia doing? 
we are doing research about the oil and gas, the impact, the lessons, what happened in the other parts of the world. We try and do research to understand the dynamics of the oil and gas industry. What are the potential implications for the economy of oil and gas and green hydrogen? What are the potential implications for exchange rate and for monetary policy? That's what we are trying to understand. We manage on behalf of the government in conjunction with the Ministry of Finance, the Svelvitsche Sovereign Wealth Fund. And you've received the figures. We started the fund something 262 million, and it's now worth more than 422 million Namibian dollars. So it was a very good approach from a very responsible decision by the Namibian government to start a fund to help cushion the country against external shocks and also to save for future generations. In conclusion, Lutrets is a unique opportunity to be a leading economic hub in Namibia and an example of prudent natural resource management that benefits Namibia and its people. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open the floor now for some questions, if there are any. Mr. Flexman? Franz, can we have a mic, please? Yes, oh, thank you very much. Uh, well, may, may I start by welcoming Mr. Kawahap and your high delegation uh, to Luderitz and to the waterfront premises. Well, thank you very much. I think the, it's a very enlightening uh, presentation. I agree fully with the context uh, in which you share your presentation. I think for the purpose of the of this audience, I may also just maybe give some um, um, information as to what is already happening, which is in line with your presentation. Um, way before, uh, before the discovery of oil and gas, and also way before green hydrogen um, was brought into the picture. Uh, about 10 years ago, the Ludrus Waterfront Development Company, which is a state-owned company, um, did certain things, I think, to ensure that uh, we are prepared in any event, because we always believe that Ludrus will rise again. So uh, we are busy. Uh, planning to to build a hotel um, this year still uh, it's the first hotel to be built since 1998 a CV hotel with a business with a private partner uh, we are also of course um, engaged with uh, private partners to set up 150 bed private hospital on the land that we own uh, we are rolling out very soon uh, infrastructure to provide offices because there is a, already now there is a crisis in this town. So we are already addressing that. But certainly, um, and of course apartments, sea uh, view apartments, because the middle class and up, uh, they have a big challenge. Uh, in terms of uh, finding uh, accommodation. So those issues are we are addressing. As you may realize, of course, government has allocated 88 million for the current financial year to the Ludwig's Waterfront. It's the highest amount in any financial year that has ever been allocated to the Ludwig's Waterfront. That will enable us to to complete this this particular 
development, this building, the transformation of the all power station. Certainly, 10 years ago, we approached government as part of the submission also to ask government to include, as part of this development, to include a university. So NAST is already here. Uh, they did some bridge courses for those students who couldn't make it to university. And we're spending money already. Um, almost 50% of this large building consists of a university. So what I'm trying to say, of course, uh, issues of restaurants and things like that, we, we have been able to address that. And we will continue, I think, to to address infrastructural uh, backlog that is here in town with the support of government. So uh, people continue to come to Luderitz uh, for leisure, for business, for education, for culture. The town never had even conference facilities which we have built. And uh, just about, as I conclude, As I conclude, uh, Mr. Gavahab, is that um, just in two weeks' time, we are going to host oil and gas in this very room. Uh, had we not created this facility, Ludres would not have been a destination to host these things. During the month of June, for the first time in the south, we are going to host Miss Namibia here. So I think I just wanted to give context. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flaxman. Um, at this juncture, I just quickly would like to um, acknowledge our NBC viewers that were uh, live with us online. Um, and we would like to say thank you for having joined us. Um, and with that, we've come to the end of the official part of the program. Um, however, in this auditorium, we will continue with the discussion. So thank you very much to the NBC live audience that we had. Thank you, Mr. Flaxman, for that contribution. Um, I will go on to the next question now. I see there's a gentleman in um, a reddish shirt. Is it reddish? <laughs> yes, sir. I'm looking at you with the, the specs. If you get the mic, please just um, also um, give your name and, 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 and shoot with your, your question. Franz here. Thank you. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Alex Kavanap. I'm usually called Alex Kavahap, but it's okay. Um, I just want to pose two quick questions, uh, Mr. Kavahap, and I will not add to what Mr. Flaxman has said. You are cordially uh, welcomed to Ludritz, our town. Um, I stand by that protocol. So my question is not general, it's not necessarily only focused on oil and gas, but there's a lot of potential in investments, foreign direct investments in mining and other fields. Um, do we really as Namibians value our goodwill? In, and with that I mean, if you look at the value of these investments which would span over 20 years and we are given a minority shareholding in these endeavors of 10, 20 percent. Uh, is that really sufficient for us to give our goodwill, our ownership of our, our resources for that 20-year period of investment? That is one question. I've listened and I've read a bit about similar investments, especially in the UAE, where the locals and citizens and the government own in excess of 71% for such. Uh, so I'm just asking, are we doing well? Second question, Mr. Kavakab, is you mentioned that our with the investment that our currency will increase in value with such discoveries of oil. Are we considering, maybe it is a contradiction because we also advocated diversification, 
But with these developments and our currency evaluating, are we discussing or considering um, delinking ourselves from the South African rent, given the volatility of our neighbors as well, so that we can become more independent and because we have a potential to pack ourselves against other current currencies or compete equally with other currencies. I rest uh, with those two questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kabaha. Um, Govern up. <laughs> Govern up. Govern up. <laughs> I will take uh, one question, one more question before the governor uh, responds. Please just state your name and shoot with your question. All right, thank you very much. My name is Bartholomew Chanja, and um, I'm a research technician by profession. Uh, thank you, Mr. Governor, for a very insightful presentation. Um, I just wanted to maybe ask, um, as a nation, um, do we have the necessary guiding frameworks, the laws, and policies with regards to mitigating the potential impacts that could result from the oil and gas industry? Do we have the laws in place already, or are we still also um, consulting, or are we still trying to get these laws in place? Thanks. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you very much for the good questions. Mr. Governor, your questions are quite powerful and very strong. So. If I hear you correctly, it's about do we value our natural resources that we only own about 10%? So 10% is carried interest. So currently our oil company, Namcor, owns about 10% in most of these blocks. Are we comfortable with that 10% or should we go to a 70% like other countries? You could probably, theoretically you could, but you need to fund your 70% and 71%. So there are two streams that you normally have as a country, two regimes. The first regime is what Angola did, what Nigeria has done, and what other countries have done. They own 70, 80% of the oil fields. So if you can find the money, you can probably do that. If you don't have the money, you probably go the other route of owning 10% and to be carried until the production is up there and you earn from that. So theoretically that's probably nothing stops you, but we have opted as a country for the carried interest regime at this stage. That's why we own only 10%. So your question is valid. Is it right? Is it wrong? That's for everybody's guess. So if we believe we could put in because you know, we, we got a presentation the other day, and it cost about 120 million US dollars just to drill one well. So if you know 120 million US dollars, not Namibian dollars, because if you think you can find that money to do that, take that risk, because, because you drill, it doesn't say you are guaranteed of success. So how many wells were, did we have that were dried in the past until we got to the latest? So, so had we had that money, or we could have funded or mobilized that money and come in and drill that one. We could probably have owned the 70, 80% of that resource. But we have opted and said, all my years, Total Energy shall, here are EPLs, come into our country, carry us for 10%. What you lose, while you are drilling, it's up to you. We don't carry anything. So that's the route we have taken as, as a nation. So, Is it right? Is it wrong? Only time will tell. But all I know is we didn't have the money to, to drill and to do appraisal drilling. Because you drill and then your next step is you do need to do appraisal drilling. After you have done appraisal drilling, you also need to go and spend money to see whether you can flow the wall. Because this well that we are talking is offshore, and it's about six kilometers below the, below the water. So it doesn't say because you found the well, we're going to develop this thing. Can you take it out commercially, sell it, 
and make money out of that. So, Mr. Governor, it's a very good question. I don't know, to be honest with you, whether it's right or wrong. Only time will tell, but we've opted for the carried entries regime at this stage. The second question that you have got is, do we think about a delinking, uh, given the changes and the volatility that you said it's happening in the currency? You know, as a central bank governor, I've got a responsibility to be responsible. So at this stage, the benefits of that agreement that we have got is outweighing the cost. What will happen in future, clearly, if the economic structure of the country changes, if the trading benefits that we have got from the arrangement is diverging, if there are monetary policy implications of this changing structure, we'll have to pause and say, what are the implications of all these for the exchange rate regime choice that we have got. It will be stupid not to ask that question. But at this point in time, there is no thinking about delinking from the current arrangement. I hope that is clear. Then, do we have guiding frameworks, policies? If you expect us to have everything in place, we probably don't have. Do we have the basics to start off with? I think our Ministry of Mines and Energy have done an excellent job. You know, they're going everywhere to go and learn. As we have done with Bank of Namibia, we've sent staff to Norway, we've sent staff to Angola. Bank of Namibia sent people to Guyana to go and learn. And the Ministry of Mines and Energy is going all around the world. They're using all the expertise they've got to get the basic laws and the frameworks in place. They even advocate the localization of the industry and the value chains. But if you think we need to have everything ticked, uh, we don't. But it's also understandable there's something new. So we're going to grow with this. But the basics that we require is in place. Yeah. Thank you, Governor. We are going to take Three more questions and then we will wrap up because we're going into lunch. There's a hand here in front. Um, I see here in front, sir, in the blue blue shirt. After which we will go with the lady in the red shirt. There's another hand there. And then if there's time, was, were you first? Okay. We Number three then. One, two. I think I saw her hand as well. If there's time, we will take your question, ma'am. Thank you. Mm, thank, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity. My name is Aser Mukapuli. I'm a local resident, very much interested in the development of our town. I, first of all, really would like to commend the, our governor and uh, the Bank of Namibia f for coming to us, coming up with this initiative. Um, because sometimes we feel left out. But when you, like the Bank of Namibia, come to Luderitz, then uh, it's so important. And the information you brought, the, the opportunities that are there in the business, and then also the information about this terrible disease that I never heard about, the Dutch disease. <laughs> so we try to do everything to prevent it. Um, my I, I need more clarification than a question. And it is more, you, uh, Mr. Governor, you mentioned something about the energy supply to Luderitz, satisfied through this new six megawatt station, 80, 80%. I don't know whether that is hypothetical or whether it is true. Maybe that can be clarified by our local. Uh, I thought this is being uh, fed into the, the central grid. Uh, that's the, the question, but I also wanted to add that you you were having questions there as to what should the Bank of Namibia do, and then you had four points there. I want you to concentrate on the Valvicia Fund, because that can only mean something. It's a sustainable uh, point that I see for the future. And one thing I want to say to my people, the people of Luderes, because we are also here waiting for things to happen, big expectations, my advice to you is let's rather not ask what the government or the Bank of Namibia or whoever can do to us, but rather what can we do? What can we bring in? So let's be prepared, as we have said, 
Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Gentlemen in the back, in the blue shirt. Uh, good morning. I'm Paul Herrero. Uh, I have more of a comment rather than a question. My my concern is the ease of business that we are uh, currently the, the, the ease of business is 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 very difficult, especially for a local person. We need more uh, uh, more open uh, uh, open door policies in the in the offices, the 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 the, the, the necessary offices, because we we as Lutheran uh, citizens we are ready. We are ready. We we only we only want when we go to an office. Say, if I want to go to most of mines, if I go to to to, to, to fisheries, if I go to 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 an environment, we want equal treatment. And then also in, uh, in terms of the the government taking the root of 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 of, of the caring interest, I I think that is more safe for our country uh, taking account our skill base. But then again, I will go back to where I've said, we need more accommodative nature within especially our institutions who are being run by the, 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 the government. The challenge is that because we apply things, we have time frames, and we, all, we would like to have ministries and, and, and uh, SOEs, and those, they should have time frames if you apply for, for something because if, if you talk about uh, in investment uh, climate, we cannot just treat investors for, from from outside uh, different and the local one who are also capable of doing that because he doesn't have the millions or the billions, but the person has the idea. We need to nurture those type of uh, activities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the lady in front in the check shirt. Good afternoon. My name is Antoinette Wentworth. I'm working for NAST. We share an office in the very same historic building. I am sharing and like to express my gratitude, um, the same as the previous speakers for the transparency and the presentation, Mr. Governor. Um, I couldn't help thinking of a pebble in a pond when I listened to your presentation. The fact that all the sectors within Namibia is touched with this um, discovery. What I would want to find out, I know that deliberations are ongoing with um, all the stakeholders in the right places. I want to find out how robust is the interaction, the engagement with the Ministry of Education to possibly start rethinking our curricula so that our students at school level already are prepared for intake at higher education and have a more decentralized education system. I thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. I will entertain the final question, the lady in the red T-shirt, and then we are, we are done with the Q&A session. Good morning, everyone. Protocol observed. Uh, my name is Victoria Ancevela. I'm the chairperson of the Namibia's Constituency Youth Forum under the National Youth Council and the Financial Management Graduate as well. Um, I would just like to ask this question for clarity purposes. As the government, governor has stated, we need to prepare ourselves as a community to start companies in certain areas. I would just like to know, is the Bank of Namibia open for funding for these companies that are willing to go into these industries. Thank you. Thank you very much for that Q&A session. Um, I, before I hand over to the governor to respond to your questions, um, I will hand over to my director once the governor has addressed the questions. The, he is the Mr. Israel Demburuka. You know him better as Kadembire Demburuka. I'm sure you've seen him here and there in Namibia society. He is our Director of Communications, Strategic Communications and International Relations, and he is responsible for the reputation of the Bank of Namibia, the face and the voice of the Bank of Namibia. So thank you very much for having listened to me. And um, Governor, yes, please take it over. 
Yeah, before I respond to those questions, let me use this opportunity to thank Zuzette and the entire team of the Bank of Namibia who prepared this presentation and this event for us. Thank you very much, colleagues. It's a pleasure working with you. The question from Asar is fed into the grid. You're probably right with that. You want me to zoom into the Velvicha Fund. The Velvicha Fund was set up between the Bank of Namibia and the Ministry of Finance and Public Enterprises for two reasons. We started preparing the country for if oil and gas comes and if there are revenues coming, what do we do with some of those revenues? Because we have seen what Norway has done. Norway has done exactly, they put up a sovereign wealth fund. They call it No Fund, and they are doing so well for that country. And we set this up from the dividends that we were supposed to declare to the government. We negotiated with the government and told them, let's put some of this into the sovereign wealth fund. And the reason for that was basically, if we get something like COVID, if we get a negative shock to the economy like that, something we haven't planned, we don't have to run around. We can go into there and take from that and save life and livelihoods. That's the first reason. The second reason was if children, our children's children come one day and they found out that there was oil in the country or there were diamonds one time, they must also benefit from this because it's also their country. And these resources are not finite. They are getting depleted. So why don't we save for them? So that is why we have started this Velvicha Fund, also known as the Sovereign Wealth Fund. I hope we can engage later. Paul's one was very much a comment that I agree with. People and literates need to be supported. You know, if they don't have the billions, they need to get the same treatment because they are the entrepreneurs. So I couldn't agree more, Paul, with your request then, but that's just a comment. Antoinette's pebble in the pond, rethinking curriculum. I'm not so sure how robust it is. All I'm knowing is from the green hydrogen side, the German government has given quite a lot of money for bursaries. We have allocated a lot of bursaries for Namibians to do masters in green hydrogen studies. Quite a lot of Namibians to go to VTC and green hydrogen. So there is cooperation with the Ministry of Higher Education in terms of training Namibians for the green hydrogen industry. Whether we started rethinking the curriculum, I actually don't know. So I'll lie if I say I know. I, I don't know. What I'm knowing is the country is preparing some people. Can Bond provide funding to, to in individuals? Uh, Victoria, the Bank of Namibia is banker to government and a banker to commercial banks. We don't give individual loans to business people. What we did recently together with the Ministry of Finance is after COVID, so many businesses actually have failed. So together with the Ministry of Finance, we set up the SME recovery scheme. We agreed with the four big banks in the country. Why don't you take some of this money and help individuals? So as part of social responsibility, Israel can answer what he is planning, thinking about that. But the bank directly to individuals, this is not the area where we, it's not within our mandate. So, but if there is a need, we have got a developmental mandate. The section 73 of the Bank of Namibia Act is talking about how are we helping in terms of development of this country. And if there is something we need to do from that perspective, we need to think about that. But we won't be able to do it directly from the bank to an individual. It will probably via, because we can't work directly with individuals. Thank you very much, Josette, and all the best. Thank you so much, Governor. And another round of applause to the Governor of the Bank, please. So it's uh, Peter Drucker who once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I think with this presentation, we are helping to create and shaping that future. What is that future that we want to see? A future through which the youth of Namibia, entrepreneurship innovation can be, uh, can take shape. And, and obviously, it's a future in which businesses can participate. It's a future in which all of us have a stake in it. And I think with 
today's presentation, we've just laid that very foundation, and we continue to have this dialogue. And as the Bank of Namibia, we don't pretend to know all of the answers. And today, we just heard very good, solid recommendations and proposals from all of us in this room. And I think what is valuable going forward is for us to engage in this discourse, in this meaningful dialogue, so that all of us can open our eyes to the reality, to what is possible, and also to what are the challenges that remain. So this is the first step. This is the first amongst conversations that we need to have as, as a nation. But importantly, as stakeholders of Ludrets and also the Karas region, you need to be at the forefront of this dialogue. Let me then thank our host once again, Mr. Flexman Samuel, the CEO of the Ludrets Waterfront for hosting us graciously in this magnificent venue. Uh, a round of applause, please. <laughs> Let me thank some people in this room that were my teachers. And uh, uh, one, one person asked me, did you study outside the country? I said, no. I went to schools like Koryanghab Junior Secondary School. I matriculated at Yanyonkar Afrikaner um, Secondary School. And the lady right there, Miss uh, Wentworth, was my English teacher, by the way. So <laughs> we, we do stand on the shoulders of giants. So thank you so much. And to all of you that came here, to our counselors that um, uh, graced uh, this event, but also that have been very instrumental in shaping the developmental discourse in Ludritz. Thank you so much for coming through and staying with us. To each and every one of you, thank you ever so much for coming through. Please, we do have lunch. Stay with us. Continue to network. Ask some of the pointed questions, but also importantly, suggest and make proposals. Because the governor is here. He sits on many, many, many committees in fact, at the Bank of Namibia, we have this uh, joke that we, he's our governor, but at the same time, I think we share him with so many, many um, officers and agencies of the government. So he sits on the Green Hydrogen Council, for instance. He's on the cabinet, cabinet committee on this and the other thing. So he's the right person to talk to uh, in terms of this conversation that we are having. Most importantly, let me also thank our viewers on our social media platform. We saw the engagements that was quite lively. Uh, uh, our former colleague, Mr. Gonzalo Pastor, who's uh, watching from Nairobi, Kenya, and all of the information that you have posted, the IMF working papers that you have posted on social media, and the engagements that you continue to have with us on this very issue, I think is instructive, and we continue to take those lessons to heart as well. So thank you once again to everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. We are launching a very important uh, activity tomorrow. We are launching our 100 Namibian dollar banknote. It's a surprise. We have uh, brought this to Ludrets, and we are launching it tomorrow um, and at the Ludrets waterfront. So please join us at 11 o'clock if you are not busy. We are also having dinner tomorrow. The governor will be unpacking the objectives and the mandate of the central bank so that all of you can know whether you can come and take out a loan from us and all of those great questions that you may have around delinking, depacking, and what have you. Come with very difficult questions. We are having a stakeholder dinner tomorrow evening at the hotel um, next door as well. So join us for those two events. It's an open invitation. Um, if anybody asks you for a, a, an invitation card or RSVP, just tell them. Our governor invited you to the event tomorrow. So <laughs> 11 o'clock, we are at the waterfront. Tomorrow evening, we are at the Nest Hotel. Thank you so much.